in your life which you changed you in a radical way. If you'd asked this to my niece Beth when she was in her early teens, she would have said, Harry Styles. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with him, I'm sure some of you are unfamiliar, uh, he was in a band called One Direction. His face was plastered over walls of countless admiring fans. Uh, Beth was one of them, and she was a big fan. Uh, I asked her once, it, it's, it's at least 15 years ago this, I said to her, do you think this is in the future that you will probably get married to Harry Styles? <laughs> and she paused, and she looked at me, and didn't say anything, she just grinned. She refused to answer because it was a hope that she clearly had, even though probably deep down she knew it was highly unlikely. And I can exclusively reveal she never did marry Harry. But as profound and, and real as she thought this person was in her life, uh, it was paper thin. Uh, she's in her late 20s now. Uh, and when I was writing this last week, I actually phoned her up. I thought, oh, let's give us a good excuse to give me an Issa ring. And I asked her, I said, what do you think of Harry Styles nowadays? Uh, and her answer, sort of turning her nose up, she said, well, he's a bit flamboyant now. Uh, still like his music, but definitely not a screaming fangirl, obsessed like I used to be. A fickle bunch, we humans. Poor Harry. But who in your life has changed you in a radical way? You may think of a parent or child or a spouse, a close friend, you may think of a celebrity or a sports icon, but Christians make a staggering claim, actually, about how Jesus can radically change our lives. How a man who walked this earth 2,000 years ago can profoundly and deeply affect us, who we can actually be united with, not just know about or loosely believe he existed, sort of nod along to his teaching, but actually be united with him now. Scripture talks about our union with Christ. The Apostle Paul has most to say on the subject, and in 2 Corinthians 5.17, amongst other places, he talks about us being in Christ. And in Galatians 2.20, amongst other places, he says that Christ is in us. He looks at the unique events at the cross at Calvary, and says we experience this with Christ. We died with Christ. We're buried with Christ. We were raised with Christ. Which can seem a bit confusing. And this phrase of our union with Christ has always struck me actually. And over the summer uh, I spent some time reading around it. Uh, in 1970, when I was just one, uh, the American writer Lewis Smedes wrote a book, Union with Christ, I came upon it probably about 20 or so years ago. Uh, the book actually is a bit of a brain tease. I don't know if I'd massively recommend it, but he begins it like this, and I thought this was good. How can a person who lived nearly 2,000 years ago radically change the human life here and now? How can Jesus of Nazareth radically affect us as persons to the depth of our being? How can he reach out over the great span of time that divides us from him and change us so profoundly that we can be described as united with him? And they're very good questions to ask. This isn't just a theological, intellectual question, but one that goes to the heart. And they were the questions, really, that dominated my summer read. And I've got four points to kind of anchor, I hope it will be helpful, this introduction to our union with Christ. Firstly, Paul on how our union is renewing, then Calvin on how this union can be useless, God on how this union is shared, and then for us, how is this union received? And I want to start with this scripture that may feel a strange starting point, and it's in Paul's second letters to the church at Corinth again, and although he has much to say about our union, we'll see it, in this verse, it doesn't get a direct m mention in this part of the letter, and it's what uh, Sue read to us, uh, it's, he's talking about our present weakness, but also the power of resurrection life. And he says these fascinating words. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, 
Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Friends, let me ask, do you sometimes feel like you might be losing heart as you consider the challenges of life, whatever they are, as you consider the reality of your faith, if you have one, and if you do, as much as you try, you may think you're performing middling at best, you're following Jesus, you want to work at it, it's important to you, uh, but however much you try, <laughs> you hover between you know, average and below average. That would be your report card. And to top it all, outwardly, we're wasting away. As I read this, and this bit I was reading on the very first week of that sabbatical, actually, I can think of exactly where it was, and I, I was imagining uh, looking in the mirror with Paul speaking these words over my shoulder. So I'm thinking, as I look in the mirror, ooh, I look tired. A few more creases appearing. The church website still has a picture of me when I'm 40. I kid myself, I look the same, but, you know, outwardly, I'm wasting away. <laughs> and there's Paul on my shoulder with these words. Dave, do not lose heart. Outwardly, you are wasting away. But inwardly, you are being renewed day by day. Alan and Mary actually used this. I found it, brother. One of your Christmas newsletters. Do you remember this one? Alan wrote this. This is 2015. He wrote, We're becoming a couple of crocs, but rejoicing in the Lord. A great encouragement to us are the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly being renewed day by day. Do you need to hear that this morning? This renewing word. On one level, we are this outer being, you know, our flesh and blood, and it can be discouraging. You don't see like you used to. You don't hear like you used to. You say pardon so many times in conversations, it's becoming frankly embarrassing. You've even resorted to putting the subtitles on the TV. A few of you are nodding. Is that the kind of outer stuff that we focus on as we look in the mirror, the outward focus? But for the believer, Paul says, there's a wonderful distinctive. There is more to me than the outer man. At, at core, I'm deeper than all the physical creaking. Inwardly, I am being renewed daily. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But the question is, how can we make that our genuine lived experience? the daily renewal thinking rather than the daily wasting away thinking? And I believe the answer is through our union with Christ. Is it as simple as that? Does that union really have that kind of power? Well, yes, I believe it does. Because Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Union with Christ. And the question I said about asking was, does, what does it actually mean then to be united with Christ, to know that renewing? There, there are three words that encompass so much. The, the Apostle Paul, he was the writer who used the phrase the most, not uniquely, and Paul sees himself primarily as a, a man in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, I know a man in Christ. And in that passage on a cursory reading, you can ask, well, who's that? Well, I think he refers to himself. If he said, Paul, how would you define yourself? That's what he would say. He would say, I am a man in Christ. Paul uses this in Christ in Christ Jesus or in the Lord over 160 times. It's incredible really, isn't it? I mean, if you think about Paul's writings in, in your Bible, about, what are they, 100 pages at the most? And he uses it 160 times. He could be used, accused of being repetitive with that kind of tally, but at the very least, you would have to say this is a key theme of his writing. 
And you might think, well, I've not really noticed it that much before. It's easy to flip past. He starts the letter to the church at Philippi, which we've used t- twice this morning, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And we can say, oh, that's just part of a greeting. But Paul would say, no, it changes everything about you. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's the most important and defining thing about you. If you look at Ephesians 1, just from verses 3 to 14, uh, which we will be doing in January, by the way, uh, I think it's there 11 times. Ephesians 1, 3, we'll just read that verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he goes on in that chapter to say that we were in Christ before the world existed, that we receive grace in him and redemption in him, that in him we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. At the risk of belaboring the point, Romans 6 says, we are possessors of eternal life in Christ. Romans 8, that we are justified and glorified in Christ, sanctified in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, called in Christ, made alive in Christ, elected, adopted and raised with Christ. Paul, in other words, throughout his letter, has his conviction that this man who lived now 2,000 years ago can bring about a radical change at the core of our being now. Not just outwardly, but an inner renewing. So rather than being about one thing, and I kind of think when I started looking at this, I I thought I'll probably be be able to define this in a paragraph. No. No. Uh, It's this sort of tapestry of Bible images of how our connection to Christ is essential for our renewing. And if Paul is a scripture writer who heralds the union most loudly, Calvin is probably the theologian that underlines its importance most strongly. He says something uh, which is quoted in just about every book and commentary I've read on the subject. And they are words which strike right to the heart of the matter. Here's what he says in his his institutes, is it called? This is a great quote. We must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. Point two, it may seem strange. You know, why are you telling us about something that is useless? <laughs> Wouldn't something useful be better? Well, I hope so we can make sure that it's not the case for us. Friends, can I ask us to consider this and ask a question? Have you become accustomed to think of Christ as a saviour who has done something outside of me rather than the one who dwells inside of me? Have you become accustomed to think of Christ as a saviour who has done something outside of me rather than the one who dwells inside of me? We may be familiar with that thinking of asking Jesus into your heart. We know that phrase, not used in scripture interestingly. But even though we accept that 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 heart change in our head, in reality our understanding of the gospel is predominantly that Jesus did something for me a long time ago. Now that is true, hallelujah. The gospel heralds something that has been done. The gospel, or good news is what the word means, says something has been done, something has happened. And Jesus, as his ministry begins, declares the good news of God. The time has come. God will rule in history in a new and perfect way. How will that happen? Well, as he shows his ministry It continues through him. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is here. And friends, that's what I love about the gospel of Jesus, the uniqueness of the Christian faith. It's not about our need to climb up or achieve something or do something. It's good news because something has been done and something has been done that we could not do ourselves. Points to the work of Jesus and especially his death and resurrection. But about our union, we see this panoply of texts that speak of our being united with him not just observing something that's been done but as being those 
in whom the Spirit of God dwells. We can easily forget, I think, that conscious appreciation that we have the indwelling presence of Christ. And, says Calvin, all he has done is useless. All that 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 we look back at and see in his ministry, his life, his death, is useless unless we're united with him. To be saved isn't just to understand the gospel message, it is to be united with the saviour. The greatest treasure of the gospel, rather than any goody or benefit that it brings, is the wonderful gift of God himself. And that may seem obvious, you might think, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But I wonder if we talk of salvation in abstract terms sometimes, thinking in the wrong way, receiving something that Christ has acquired for us, a gift that we can apprehend somehow, rather than receiving Christ himself. Friends, we cannot receive the benefits of Christ without receiving the giver himself. We receive his wonderful gift of salvation because we receive him, Christ in you. And this takes us to the profound mystery at the heart of the gospel that Paul describes in Colossians 1. If you turn to this, Colossians 1, 26 to 27, it's on page 1183. I've become servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery revealed after generations, Christ dwelling in the church, in the believer, I don't think we actually do that well with mystery. Uh, I remember an old episode of Hancock's Half Hour. I quite liked Hancock's Half Hour. Uh, It was called The Missing Page. And he was reading a murder mystery book uh, and and he got to the last page and the last page was missing. And so the whole episode is him hunting around trying to find another copy of this book so that he can find out the end. Um, He never does. (laughs) He never gets an answer to the mystery. It's very frustrating for him. But here, just because this mystery of our union may ultimately be beyond beyond our full comprehension, that doesn't mean we throw up our hands and say, well, there's nothing that we can understand. On the contrary, Scripture gives us a rich depth of insight into the mystery of this precious union we can have. A mystery in the Bible isn't a frustrating or unfathomable thing that we'll probably never solve. One description I heard and I like is that biblical mystery is God's open secret. It's God's eternal purpose revealed in Christ and especially in his death and resurrection. There are other mysteries in the Christian faith. How Jesus is fully God and fully man. How can he be one and yet exist in three persons? I remember some years ago doing that, that reading John's Gospel one-to-one with someone and this lovely guy I was doing it with was stuck on verse 1, didn't get very far. Chapter 1, verse 1, he stuck. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he said, well, what's the Word? What's the Word? That makes sense, does it? And of course, being sort of a bit churchified, you know, I knew it was Jesus. I was excited, and I said, well, you know, when you find out, <laughs> is it going to blow your mind? But it's also a mystery. We may not fully understand that, but we can still speak of the wonder. So regards the mystery of our union with Christ, Calvin goes on to say, I'm overwhelmed by the depth of this mystery and am not ashamed to join Paul in acknowledging my ignorance and admiration. Let us therefore labour more to feel Christ living in us than to discover the nature of that intercourse. And that is the aim that Paul states as he continues in Colossians, still on page 1183, chapter 2, verse 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden 
all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's not a bad goal, is it? That we know the mystery of God, namely Christ. And in Christ, that's all we need. We find the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that, point three, is the remarkable thing that God wants to share. He wants to share this mystery with us. And we stand amazed that he wants to. This is a remarkable thought, friends. And I think it's right to say this. That when we are united with Christ, when we are in him, all that he is and all that he has that he can share... He shares. There are some things he can't share. His incommunicable attributes, to use the posh phrase. His divinity, for instance, he can't share that. But all he can, he would share with those who are united with him. Romans 8, 32. Oops. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? What generosity. When looking at this over the summer, I desperately tried to take a step back from the merely theological questions of what this meant to consider what it means personally, that in all these ways I'm united with Christ, this precious sharing, that through this union... I can walk deeper with him. I know some of you have read the book Deeper by Dane Ortland. Uh, he helpfully outlines four ways we think of Christian growth. I wonder how you might define it. Is our growth God then me, God not me, God plus me or God in me? God then me says, uh, God saves me, he opens my eyes, hallelujah. Uh, but the baton is then passed to me. It's now down to me to live and serve and then we can forget his powerful indwelling. It's exhausting. Then there's one that says, God, not me. That says it's all him. He saves me and then I sort of let go and let God. The first one elevates human responsibility. The second one sort of does away with it altogether. God plus me gets closer. A collaboration where God does a bit Uh, And I do my bit, bit like going Dutch in a restaurant, 50-50 kind of deal. Uh, But then the last one, God in me. Here is this unfathomable sharing, friends. God saves me, then spiritually unites me with his son. This growth, as Jonathan Edwards describes it, not, not God does some and we do the rest, but God does all and we do all. We are wholly passive and wholly active. That's human responsibility and and divine sovereignty. Friends, it blew me away. It is the most remarkable act of sharing. And no, I don't fully comprehend it, but I treasure it. So I hope you're following okay. Point one, that we might see with Paul that it is something for our renewing, but point two, be warm with Calvin that it could be something that's quite useless to us. And then point three, encouraged by God that this is something he wants to share with us. But the question for each of us is, uh, do we want to run that race? Do we desire that union? Who here is prepared for a marathon? Yeah, I knew Gareth Barnes was going to put his hands up. I mean, it's just unfair, isn't it, really? I know many of you have. It takes an honest commitment to do something like that, doesn't it? Uh, If you don't want to run that race really deep down, you won't do it. Uh, I've never prepared for a marathon. I know that probably comes as a shock to many of you. I've not done that. Um, I did try couch to 5K, though. Have you seen that one? From sitting on a couch eating a bag of crisps (laughs) to 5K. Uh, Manageable, surely. From, From the couch to piddling little 5K, did I manage it? No, truthfully, I didn't get through it. But I clearly didn't want to run that race enough. Friends, do you want this communion with God? Do you want that in a deepening way, honestly? The most wonderful thing you can long for is to have God himself, to wonder at his beauty, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, as the psalmist says. You can't tire of that. 
I'm sure many of you have seen the Grand Canyon. It's impressive, isn't it, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon. Wherever you land on it, you can't really exhaust the possibilities of seeing its different colours and contours. Uh, the vastness of it leaves you in awe. But if you got there and, sort of, and couldn't be bothered to have a look, you thought, oh, no, I can't be bothered with that, really. I'm going to stay in the caravan. Now, there'd be something wrong with you, wouldn't there? In the same way, if someone has no appetite, if you're not eating, you know there's probably a problem. The joy that can be ours is to gaze at a God who is infinite beyond our imagining, who is so marvellous that we could look at him for all eternity and not exhaust our wonder. And if looking at God and having this union with him is not appealing, there must be something wrong. Not in our appetite, but our soul. If we're believers, we've begun gazing. And so then we read with unveiled faces, behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Friends, you want that communion with God in a deepening way, honestly. That same psalm that speaks of gazing at the beauty of the Lord, it's Psalm 27, goes on to say, you have said, seek my face. That's the offer. And what's the psalmist's response? Your face, Lord, do I seek. Your face, Lord, do I seek. And that is an ongoing journey. It may be a daily f- fight, certainly a clash of wheels, isn't there, when we're tempted to give up or despair. But can we say with Paul, Philippians 3, I want to know Christ. Not just about the gifts he's acquired, the information, but Christ himself, union with him. So would you please ask that this morning as we think of the renewing power that Paul speaks of, the warning Calvin gives, and the gift that God desires to share with us. Am I united with Christ? Ask that. Have I received it ever? The biblical description of a saving response to Christ is to repent and believe. Believe that he is Lord and has finished forever the work of our salvation. Romans 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And then repent, acting on that belief, reversing your direction based on what Jesus has done and said, because apart from repentance, there is no salvation. Have you done that? Are you united to him? If not, all his benefits are useless. And I will feel daily that I'm wasting away rather than being renewed. And if I am united with Christ, have I sort of along the way forgotten what it means to go back to our opening text am I feeling that I'm wasting away rather than experience that promising promised renewal well friends remember that the same Christ who was perfect in obedience who overcame every temptation who had compassion on the sick who had the humility to wash his disciples feet who shattered barriers suffered died and was raised to life That same Christ is living in you. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. Isn't that the most incredible thing you will ever hear? A union that reaches right up to the profound mystery of the gospel and right down into the depths of our heart to fill us with joy and hope and comfort and strength. It excites me. It amazes me. And as we come to the communion table shortly, let's remember these things. It's renewing, but it can be useless. It's shared, but will we receive? Let's pray together.